Okay, thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Um, I'd like to welcome you to another session of the Greenwich Roundtable. Our topic this morning is best practices in alternative investing, avoiding mistakes. Uh, today's, uh, today's session is the formal release of our seventh best practices white paper that focuses on the limited partner experience. Uh, by way of history, we first started this project in Ted Seide's conference room in 2002, almost 10 years ago. So it shows you how fast we work. Uh, well, while today's session launches the concept of avoiding mistakes, our speakers have been selected for their diversity of experience and not necessarily because they agree with what we've written. And uh, I will briefly introduce them after I say the obvious. Our speakers' views are their own and don't necessarily represent the views of the round table or its staff trustees or members. Uh, um, Ted Seides is the president of uh, Protégé Partners, a pioneering limited partner that invests in small and specialized hedge funds on an arm's length and seed basis. Uh, Ted began his career in the Yale University Investment Office in 1992 under David Swenson. Uh, Ted is also a trustee of the Greenwich Roundtable, chairman of our programming committee, uh, responsible for scores of rising stars that sit on this dais, and currently winning a bet with Warren Buffett. For now. Hugh Culverhouse is the principal of Culverhouse Limited, a family investment office that invests in hedge funds, real estate, and securities, as well as the chairman of Palmer Ranch, a development of 10,000 acres in the heart of Sarasota County. Uh, Hugh began his career at the SEC's Division of Enforcement as a trial attorney. He continued as an assistant U.S. attorney in Miami uh, during the 1980s. Culverhouse was a member of the NFL's Finance Committee in the early 1990s, and the family is a prominent donor at the University of Alabama, the Crimson Tide. All right, roll tide. <laughs> and um, we have free caps for everyone. <laughs> Mark Phillips began, became a naval aviator in the early 1970s, serving as a flight instructor, a carrier-based fighter pilot, and the manager for test and evaluation of the F-18 Hornet. Captain Phillips spent 29 years with Continental Airlines, serving as both fight, flight instructor, check pilot for the DC-9, DC-10, Boeing 757, and 767 aircraft. Mark is now retired in beautiful Durango, Colorado. And the moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable today is Mark Silverstein. Mark is the Chief Investment Officer of Endurance Services and Insurance Company. More importantly, he's the Chairman of our Education Committee, the working group that writes the Best Practices series. Avoiding Mistakes will be the fourth white paper that Mark collaborated on. He also serves as a, as a trustee of the Greenwich Roundtable Board. And please welcome Mark as he kicks off today's session. Mark? Thank you. That's a bad start. <laughs> Well, good morning, everyone. You know I'm here. Um, I want to thank uh, Ted and Hugh and Mark for joining us this morning. It should be an interesting discussion, um, and I look forward to your insights on this topic. Uh, I just thought I'd take a moment to talk about the piece that's coming out, and I, we have copies, I assume, at the end for everyone. I'm not sure, but anyways, um, the latest best practices piece. Uh, it was the collaborative effort of a number of people. Um, uh, Rusty Olson, who's over here, was the chief writer for it and took the, the information from a, a wide group of people that were involved. The main uh, group was Ray Gustin, who's also here, uh, Steve, um, Adam, which I saw somewhere. Where'd Adam go? He's out. He'll be back in. Uh, Rip Reeves, uh, Sammy Romano, and myself, and uh, Ed Barksdale. Is Ed here? No? Okay, and uh, plus we had a wider group of people that we uh, interacted with and um, learned from in order to put this piece together. Uh, so, and that's really the context for today's discussion is avoiding accidents and looking at it from the LP's perspective, what can investors do to avoid being in a situation they'd rather not be in. Uh, that's really the objective of the piece, how to avoid being in funds that get into trouble, either through bad investing or other kinds of problems. It's um, what we really try to do in it is provide different kinds of warning signs of problems, things to look for, 
and uh, basically yellow and white red flags. None of them are guaranteed. I'd say one thing that it certainly isn't is a guarantee to avoid bad investments. It's pretty obvious investing is a risky business and, uh, and it's a gray line where something goes from being risky to really a problem. And it's, it's a difficult thing to determine. But what we try to do in this in a very kind of clinical manner and non-sensational manner is look at different cases through time and see what, what clues there were and what a detective could have done to try to help get out of problems. One of the things we also noticed is that, uh, like many things in life, and I think that will come out in some of the stories we hear today, is often something very small, a very small problem, if it's not taken care of, can quickly spin out of control and become a very big problem. And so under, trying to detect what those small problems are and how those small problems are being taken care of can be a good predictor of whether you will have problems in the future. So, um, so those are a few things that we'll, you'll see in that and we'll probably hear about today. today. So with that, I'll turn it over and uh, Ted, if you'd like to go. Thanks, Mark. Um, as Steve mentioned, I've been involved in investing in managers for the better part of 20 years and the last 10 exclusively focused on small hedge funds. And in that time, probably have invested in the vicinity of around 60 startups. And so most of my comments are going to be talking specifically about lessons from, from startup hedge funds. I just want to start by saying that everything I've learned from doing this over the last two decades leads me to believe that investing in smaller hedge funds in the hedge fund space, uh, I should say the right small hedge funds, um, is the answer that investors are looking for in the hedge fund space today. So meaning the opportunity to generate returns and high risk adjusted returns. You have a space where the, the allocation of capital to talent is inefficient, meaning it's just not the case that the most talented small hedge funds are the largest all the time. Uh, and the dispersion of returns is wide. And, and so that's true in general. It's also true within strategies. So there are opportunities to add value. Um, but like everything else, on average, the results will be average. Um, so with that, I, I wanted to do a top 10 lessons uh, from having made mistakes investing in startup hedge funds. Um, so the first is that if you participate in investing in startups, and if you ultimately achieve the results that you're looking for, you will make a mistake. Um, not only that, you'll look back and see that that mistake was imminently knowable and in violation of lots of what you could read in best practices. Um, part of that is because what you're doing is underwriting something that hasn't yet fully formed. So you have to be able to look and see what you think can be achieved, and it's just not there. Um, and the reason is resource constraints. So a startup hedge fund doesn't have the access to capital to hire every last person they would want. Um, the premise that these managers make is uh, if they build it, or if you build it, they might come, but you don't know if they will. It's not field of dreams. Um, and it's very hard to put an all-star team together on day one. Um, so one specific example, there's discussion and best practices about uh, hedge funds having an independent risk manager. I have never seen an independent risk manager in a startup hedge fund. Um, because of that, as an investor and allocator, you need to consider your own governance structure and the ability to withstand mistakes. Um, most institutional allocators are just not accustomed to having line item mistakes. If you have a 15 or 20 manager hedge fund portfolio, the one that doesn't do well gets shot. And the lessons that people learn from that are clearly startup hedge funds are bad investments, so we should never do that again. Um, mistakes are seen as a scarlet letter, not an integral part of the investment process. Um, and you know that statistically. I, there were numbers that came out last week that 60% uh, of the capital invested in hedge funds is in the same 100 firms, and 90% is in the 340 firms that have more than a billion in assets. People just aren't investing in this space. Um, and if, if your governance structure does allow it, you have to think differently about portfolio construction. And you can't put 10% of your capital in a startup fund in a 10-manager portfolio. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, so second, the best way to avoid mistakes uh, is to not participate entirely. 
When you're inside the sausage factory, a lot of times you're amazed that anyone would want to join you. And it's absolutely the case in this space. Um, and because of that, it really doesn't make a lot of sense to invest in startups unless you're compensated for taking that additional risk. And so that compensation could be in the form of reduced fees or better transparency um, or, in some instances, capacity. Um, but it's something you can't do halfway. Um, so it, it's very dangerous to sort of have a portfolio and say, well, maybe we should think about adding a startup or getting involved in this space because you're dealing with a very limited opportunity set and it's unlikely to succeed over time. Uh, the third, beware of story fund investing. Uh, we're probably all familiar with the notion of story, story stock investing. Somebody likes the story, they buy it, you hear a lot about that in the growth sector. Um, most startups are story funds. Uh, you talk to any investor about a hedge fund they're invested in, doesn't matter if it's a startup or one of the largest in the industry, and everyone ha can tell you an elevator pitch story of why they're invested. In fact, most of the time, that's three quarters of what they know about the fund. It takes a lot of work to get past the story in a startup and really understand what you think you're investing in, and you have to be prepared to do that. Fourth, there are two types of funds that succeed. Uh, those that are lucky, and those that are lucky and good. <laughs> Part of that is absolutely true because there's a virtuous cycle or a vicious cycle that comes with startup funds. Um, so you think about this, if, if you're good and you have good luck and you have early performance, you're more likely to attract assets in the early stages. That has a, a virtuous cycle with the portfolio manager's behavior and confidence. They generate assets under management, they're more confident, they perform better, um, and they continue to raise money. It also works in reverse. The performance isn't good at the start. Most of the investors don't show up, and uh, it, it can be very difficult for startups. Fifth, uh, two heads are better than one, as long as one is slightly smaller than the other. Uh, there are multiple skill sets needed for a hedge fund to survive, and they're often different skill sets to make both the investing side and the business side work. And the way we like to look at it, you need one person to drive the car, and you need another one second guessing them from the passenger seat. Dual PM structures rarely succeed, um, and dual PM structures that come out of convenience, because two people happen to be thinking about starting a fund uh, at the same time, that's a recipe for failure. Six. Personnel turnover by a startup is usually a good thing. Uh, this gets back to the notion of resource constraints. The day you start, you often can't and don't have the resources to hire exactly the analyst that you might want, exactly the CFO you might want, exactly the head of uh, the business side that you might want. And if the business has legs early on, a, a savvy business person actually has the opportunity to upgrade their talent. Um, and when we've seen that, it almost always impacts future returns positively when those changes are made. And it reveals a lot about the leader of the business. So most of the people who are starting hedge funds have never run a business before. And you don't, they've probably never fired someone and many of them have never had people report to them. Uh, so it's interesting to see when they're in that crux of having someone who's okay, but now that you can get someone better, what they decide to do. That concept is severely misunderstood by investors. Uh, to investors, all turnover is bad. Um, and that actually makes sense from the pattern recognition of most investors' experience. If you're investing in a mature, large fund and senior people leave, it usually is a bad sign. It just happens to be exactly the opposite on the startup side. Um, so as a result, Investors usually miss that inflection point and the potential good returns that come when, a, when a, the, the head of a smaller hedge fund sort of done the right thing. Um, what's interesting is that investors are more than happy to chase those returns after the fact. Seven, individuals and partnerships are more complicated than you will ever know. Um, managers themselves often don't realize the psychological and behavior characteristics that are driving themselves, the culture, the dynamics in a small group of people. Um, and self-awareness of the leader is 
one of the most important skill sets in a, in a hedge fund being successful. What's difficult from the allocator's perspective is the incentives for the GP to share the truth are very, very weak. Right? There is almost no situation where someone who's running a fund will tell you exactly what they think is going on. And, and let me tell you, it's what they think is going on because the truth is in the eye of, beho of the beholder. So probably the best way to get information about funds and smaller funds is from the analysts on the team. And they will tell you the truth because they're a little bit too naive to tell you otherwise. At the same time, they have an ax to grind. Right? They might be frustrated that they're not getting paid. And in fact, it might be the right decision to have not paid that person. So it's very, very difficult to really understand what's going on. Uh, eight, managers are always too optimistic when they start. Uh, I had a fund in last week that was you know, telling me about their, their relatively unique characteristics. It was a team that had managed money for a while. Uh, they had more money than most to put to work. In fact, it was sort of their second year in business. And so they were unique. Um, I've heard that story about 80% of the time. Um, managers are, are too optimistic about their ability to attract capital. And they're also too op op optimistic about their ability to generate returns from the day they start going forward. Or, or as I like to say, the hardest day to invest is always today. Uh, nine, hedge funds are sold, not bought. Uh, I think this is very different from you know, 15 or 20 years ago when I started in the business. Um, this has, oh, obvious, has obvious implications for the managers in their business, but it also has implications for your investment. Uh, most managers underappreciate the time and commitment and consistency it takes on the sort of business development side of the business. Um, and they also don't under, uh, appreciate the extent to which marketing and investor relations is an ongoing continuous process. It doesn't end the day that the money comes in the door. Um, so what happens is uh, if, the fr if their frame of mind isn't right from the get-go, this notion, there was, there was a, a statement a number of years ago that sort of 50% of all hedge funds, startup hedge funds, fail because of operations. That's about 100% wrong. Um, but what happens is the managers, their expectations of how they're going to spend their time aren't met. And it's not that they can't focus on their investing portfolio. It's just that their job has changed and they don't realize it. And lastly, no one, including me, has all the answers. Uh, there is no magic wand and no silver bullet for getting uh, your investments right in startup funds. And uh, I think one of the, the worst things that have happened to the startup business is the presence of Renaissance Medallion. Uh, everyone believes that they can be Renaissance Medallion, and it creates hopes and dreams that never exist. Renaissance Medallion probably wouldn't make it today as a startup. Uh, that said, early stage investing in hedge funds has a much better chance to generate alpha, um, to provide higher risk adjusted returns than in large hedge funds, and to allow investors to encompass a broad opportunity set. Uh, but it has to be done well, uh, and it has to be done wholeheartedly. Um, and like many things in, in investment management in general, it requires a full dedication of active management to the space. Um, there's a degree to which investing in a broad swath of large hedge funds may well be just fine and get investors the exposure they're looking for um, in a form of a passive index fund type fashion. This is the opposite, and it's very hard uh, to do half-heartedly. Thanks, Ted. Can you, um, early in your discussion, you were talking about, you know, mistakes happen. Can you talk for a moment about how you manage those mistakes so that the sort of the uh, collateral effect doesn't overwhelm the actual mistake and how you turn it into a positive. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are all kinds of different types of mistakes. My favorite, which we haven't seen in a number of years, was, was said, you know, if you give someone the steering wheel for the first time, they put pedal to the metal, and you just hope they, they're not going to drive right into the Hudson River. Um, that happens. So uh, position sizing. Is, is an obvious but most important one. Uh, the tricky thing about startups is most people who invest in startups want to attract some type of, uh, most allocators want to extract some type of additional rents. 
So whether it's a fee discount or a seed agreement. And those additional rents require size. So it's a very tricky equation sometimes. You can't just put a million in and get all these special deals, yet a million might be the right position size. Um, expectations and rigorous risk management of risk controls. So on the seeding side of our business, uh, we ask managers to fully articulate a set of risk guidelines that are comfortable for them and appropriate for their strategy. And we don't let them go sort of outside the sidelines on the football field. Um, if they do, we can exit. Um, so there, there, are, there are things you can do. Most of what happens if your judgment is pretty good is opportunity cost, not real cost. But in our business, opportunity cost is just as expensive as real cost. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, if all of y'all were general partners of hedge funds, private equity, dear, don't write this down. It's not profound. This is simply common sense. And I disagree with 90% of what I could understand from Ted. If you folks were the head of hedge funds, I would feel like you were proctologist, and I was a patient criticizing your digital use. And that would make me nervous. But since I'm in a room full of friends, my sphincter is relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> Let's address what you want to avoid. And again, dear, quit writing. <laughs> Let's talk about avoidance. Then we're going to talk about what I do, which probably something you shouldn't do. And then I'm going to tell you the third thing that you won't do, that I love to do. The first thing, let's take broad principles. If you're going to invest in a fund where a man has a pig in a $40 million condo, and it is not a relative or a wife, don't invest. If a man buys a $65 million mansion in Colorado, it's obvious from his looks he's not his steer. And he brags to Bloomberg. He got a great deal because the Arab sheik paid a hundred million. Don't invest. Don't invest in someone whose life is a charity and the people at the charity compete to donate the most money because they want to beat the other hedge fund guy, even though neither they, their children, or their wife We'll drive above 112th Street and ever go into the area where their money's invested. Now, let's talk about the simple things with a small fund. If you walk in, you look around, the space is okay, but you notice they're renting a small space in a larger space. And every time you ask, well, where's the head of your fund? And you get an answer, well, he's in China. And I said, wait a minute, he's in China, you're investing in South American securities. Can I talk to him? No, you can't talk to him. Avoid it. That's one of his ideas that I disagree with. A startup fund where you cannot meet the head guy and they're in little sublease space, walk out the door. They don't have to be made off to rip you off. Look for simple signs. I come from the country. I can smell what my dog ate from 100 yards. A lot of times I agree. I probably would like to have eaten what he did compared to what I was served. I have a very thin Jewish wife who's a great cook, so of course I'm talking about Burger King. None of y'all know her, do you? Okay. What's instinct built on? I've had 20 years in this business. When I started, the spreads were so wide, I could take two garbage trucks, run through with no leverage, 
and almost get triple digit returns. What are they today? The spreads are so damn narrow, you over leverage and you're lucky to get 12. Well, within the last three months, I redeemed 35% of my hedge funds. I'll probably redeem more. Where did I put my money? Vanguard 500. It cost me a couple of bips. I'm beating 90% of y'all in this room, right? Anybody beating me, raise your hand. I'll invest with y'all. But let's, let's look at the simple thing about hedge funds. And the first three examples I gave you really demonstrated. If your GP has made so much money that he can spend $106 million on a piece of art by an artist who is laughing like hell, the artist has gotten rid of his manager, he don't want to give a commission to a manager. And he's wearing his baseball cap sideways. He's getting his picture, and he's in the AR on site. He's cool, and he wants to buy a baseball team. Or you got Paul's partner who wants to own the Celtic. You know what? If you're in it, leave. If you're not in it, don't invest. And here's a simple reason. If your manager has made so much money that he feels secure, then let me tell you, all of us are suckers to invest because all that guy cares about is growing his assets and clipping that 2% coupon that all of you are stupid enough to give him. Look at the returns. If somebody belts December with 17%, Okay, the guy's front-loaded. What's going to happen next year? Zero. Two percent. If you got $40 billion, two percent's bigger than Ted's fund that he wants you to buy and look at. Think of that. Do you really want to invest with anybody with AUM above $15 billion? Uh, I see your heads turning. You do. Quit. Get out. They can't make money. I've been quoted in the Wall Street Journal about a person I've sued. I compared his technique and abilities to two things. One, a Boston whaler. Now, he isn't it. Two, the Queen Mary. Well, he is it. Now, let me ask you all a simple question, because you, you all live by the water. What can turn a closer circle? A Boston whaler or the Queen Mary? If you look at the Queen Mary, what do you have to invest in? This is simple. Illiquid investments. Because you sit there and you're so big, the only position you can take is so large it's illiquid. But how do you mark it? You get three categories. We all know the three. The first category is market price. Okay, you look at an investment in an insurance company you've made, and you go, how long will it take me to get out of it? How long will it take my manager? Well, if you eliminate the buy side volume, and that guy's going to need 14 to 20 days to get out, because every buyer went to the Riviera. You got an illiquid situation you don't want to be in. Of course, to get out's nine months, so you're stuck, lean back, and enjoy the ride, because you're not getting out. If you look, they should not be marking to market. They should be discounting their price. They should go to level C because they're too big. You want somebody who can liquidate a bad position. You want a Boston whaler. You want flexibility. Now, here's the biggest problem I have. I fall in love. My wife does not like it. I can walk down the street in San Francisco and fall in love about every 10 feet. <laughs> She holds my arm closely, and she says, if you turn your head, 
one more damn time, I'm going to kick you. It's probably right. So I look straight ahead, wear sunglasses, and I move my eyes. <laughs> I've never met a hedge fund manager that my wife didn't look at their photo. Of course, I try and slip the same photo. It doesn't work. She's perceptive. We've been married decades and decades, and she knows me quite well. So I fall in love. I'm not metrosexual. I'm not homosexual this week, but <laughs> I may vote for Obama, so I use that. <laughs> I like my managers. I adore them. We have a ball. I have, with the exception of one who would not allow me in this building, uh, he and I have some present difficulties. I like my managers. They are personable. I talk to them <clears throat> daily, weekly, on weekends. I'm emailing a guy in California. He and I are going back and forth, nighttime. But here's the problem. If you fall in love, you don't leave. At some point, you need to be a Gene Kelly movie. You need to sing in the rain. Gene Kelly wasn't dancing with another person. He was dancing by himself. That's because he got the hell out of a hedge fund that he needed to. None of y'all know that, but I have the original script. <laughs> discipline. How do I discipline? You probably wouldn't do this in a million years. I'm a cross-dresser. I'm a CPA and a trial attorney. So you look at the disciplines of your life and you go, all right, Culver House, it's been eight years when you started. I'm 20. I got to get some organization because I need a piece of paper to tell me what to do. So I started. And the other thing, I didn't know how to do part of Microsoft's program. So I taught myself. First, I did my wine inventory. I went, like, Christ, I got too much. Second, I started a spreadsheet on my hedge funds. And in the hedge funds, month by month, beginning the first page, beginning, ending, plus, minus. If I put more money in or take it out, what's the final balance? That's my monthly. My weekly, I'm as compulsive because I want to know what my liquid assets are. What did they change? What have I got to invest? Then I do a graph. And, and this is anal compulsivity at its highest. This is <coughs> exponential. I do a graph that plots every single hedge fund. And I've got reams of them. I tell my kids in a letter, when I die, go find that, because that's going to be your key. If you start looking and a hedge fund starts going like that when the others are going like this, and if you think every hedge fund's not beta, you're dreaming. If you got alpha, you have a one-time event. It's probably not going to happen. Again, you're going to have a drift. A guy does subprime, he makes 800, 200, 400. Next year, there ain't no subprime. So what are you going to do, big banks? OK, but that's not why I invested with it. That graph teaches you, boom, rocket goes up, rocket goes down. Great, it ain't 4th of July. You look, and if somebody has a certain amount of bad months, you may love them, you may have dinner, you may email, you may send at the bar mitzvah, you may send a great present, mazel tov. But you know what? You call them and you say, sweetheart, I've loved you forever. I've looked at you when my wife didn't want me to, but baby, it's time I got to go. I recently did with somebody I've been with for Lord over 10 years. Returns are great. Last year, a little bit less than great, but I'm still up over 400%. I could ride it, but I kept feeling uneasy. I kept smelling my dog, 
And I said, man, that's something he ate I don't like. And so I put in my redemption. I did the same thing up to 35%. Now, that doesn't mean I'm not investing. But what areas are you investing in? Well, you look at your chart. And, okay, that sphere, the one I've liked for four years since mortgage hedge funds, I have made a fortune. But the land once your mortgages go back to the norm. Right now, you can, up until a short while ago, drive truck through. Now you're at 8 to 12 times because you're about that close. And when it gets like that, you're going to have to be at 20 times on leverage. So I already know the great friends had dinner with one last night phenomenal meal. They actually picked up the bill. Do you believe that they paid for my dinner? But goodbye. I already know when the goodbye is ticking. Credit funds, they're good. Anything else you have, get rid of. Why do you want a long short? Why do you want, quote, a global? Global my rear. Okay. Global, what a joke. Long, short. Okay, you can long, you can short. Why don't you buy Vanguard? You do a hell of a lot better than what y'all are doing. Niche, follow your niche. What's doing well? They're no alpha. They're all beta. We're all the same, but go into an alpha niche and you can figure it out. Right? Pick up AR, pick up anything. It tells you the niche. Pick the best ones in the niche, that's easy. Don't meet them at the beginning. You may fall in love. Read about them, talk to them on the phone. You may walk in and go, hmm, I'm glad I was making money. I'd have never invested had I known this guy looks this way and he can't talk. Okay, I invested with my brain instead of my heart and my stomach. The third area is very brief. If you're down, if you realize there was a drift, your best weapon's Google. And now, this is sophisticated. Cost you millions of bucks a year. But Google, Google your hedge fund. Bloomberg it's not as honest. If you Google your hedge fund, you Google its investments. I had a private equity fund with such a spectacular group of talent, they had me meet them at Columbia. Now, I'm an NYU graduate. Columbia's uptown. That's the hall of academia. It was impressive. Like fool, I invested. After about a year, the performance was not as promised, but they certainly took their share. I started looking, and what was represented to me is a certain level of ownership in a company wasn't. What had happened is the company had sold more equity, and the private equities fund got dissipated. But what I got in my monthly reports was a different story. They apologized for a manager in Switzerland who unfortunately stole all the money for the company. <coughs> and I start thinking, who's running the bus? You got impressive credentials, but who's doing it? So you do what you normally do. Your trial attorney, you pay them a visit, and as I talked to them, they started looking at the floor. There were three of them. They looked at the floor. I looked at them, and then I looked at the floor. I said, guys, what's on the floor? I didn't toss, I didn't toss money on the floor. Why are you looking at the floor? And then I said, are you embarrassed? Did you screw up? Are you afraid to tell me? 
They didn't look up. I said, guys, I'll see you. I went home. My best friend and I tried cases together. I said, Larry, here's what happened. Rothstein's their CPA. Something smells. Hit them with the letter. Letter goes. Letter goes to the CPA. They're very nice. They say, look, if we can find somebody to buy your position, it's probably at 50 cents. I ain't mean, good. You got about three weeks and I'm going to sue you. Third week, get a phone call from a law firm. <clears throat> okay, we'll give you back your money. I said, that's terrific. Would you sign a release? I said, sure. If you'll wire the money. They send the documents through the internet. They also screw up and they send employment agreements for all the general partners. I burst out laughing. Had my attorney call up and I said, you know, I think you ought to pay more. He told them, your lawyer in Washington screwed up. I see what you're doing. And you're protecting yourself against the next Hugh Culver house. They paid a little bit more. Let's go do a hedge fund. If you get over-concentrated, if you want to get out, if they don't let you walk into the building, but you do get to meet an investor rep, they buy you a splendid lunch. And you say afterwards, can I go back? I, I'd like to meet the managers who interest me. And the answer is no. At that point, you go, something wrong here. You smell your dog, you don't like what he ate, and you start to get out. Then things get bad. As you're starting to get out, it tumbles. When you get out, you go back to Larry, and you said, Larry, something's wrong here. And that begins process again. So avoidance, no pigs. Mechanical, don't fall in love. Use your chart. Third, if you get stung and you're wronged, go to your lawyer. Thank you all. Thank you, Hugh. Very good. Um, you left me a little speechless. <laughs> Relax your sphincter. <laughs> was, uh, Not right now. Breathe a lot of good advice. <laughs> Mark, I warned you. Yes. <laughs> so uh, we're going to turn to Mark now and take a somewhat different perspective. And uh, one of the. What, no questions? questions? I love questions, don't worry. <laughs> um, one of the things, you know we wanted to bring out in the piece and that Mark represents here is that whether it's hedge funds or flying or walking across the street, accidents tend to compound and a lot of techniques that can be used in avoiding accidents are common across different industries. And in the piece we talk about a number of different industries and how accidents are approached. So we thought it would be very interesting to hear about um, how other industries where not only do you, you could lose your money, but you could lose your life, uh, how that's dealt with, so. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I'd like to make an admission that I'm very fascinated with your business. Um, as my wife will attest, I'm a sort of a financial news junkie. I read a lot. And it seems as though the more I learn, the more I find that I really don't know. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about risk management in aviation. Something, uh, it's actually a little bit on, uh, goes along with uh, your type of risk management, believe it or not. Uh, I don't know, has anybody out there uh, bought into the myth that uh, the majority of air airline accidents are uh, pilot error? Well, it's a true myth. It's, uh, it's actually in the neighborhood of 55% which uh, is quite stunning, with another 5% uh, just for other human errors. I want to talk, uh, you know, I love the uh, case studies that were in this paper, and uh, 
I thought of probably five or six uh, that I could present here of accidents or almost accidents and uh, what I learned from them. But uh, we only have room or time for maybe one or two. Uh, the first one occurred when I was a brand new hire with the airlines. I was a flight engineer, uh, which is the guy that sits behind the co-pilot and the captain and has kind of a worthless job. And uh, it was probably my third or fourth trip. And we were flying from Denver to Albuquerque. And the weather in Albuquerque was uh, forecast to be snow flurries. And our alternate was El Paso, which was uh, forecasted, forecast to be clear and sunny. Anyway, we take off for uh, Albuquerque. And uh, we get there, and lo and behold, they have snow removal operations going on. And they tell us to hold. So we're overhead. We can, we're right over the top of the field, going round and round. And finally, we got down to where we were getting lower on fuel. We got to our bingo fuel, which is the fuel you arrive at where you just have enough to get to, to your alternate. And the captain goes, uh, gets on the radio and asks air traffic control for clearance to El Paso. So off we go. And the captain hadn't said anything to me at all. I'm just almost invisible to him. Anyway, uh, the flight from uh, Albuquerque to El Paso is about 45 minutes or so. We get there, and I don't know if anybody in here has ever been in a sandstorm in the West, but there is one hell of a sandstorm going on. And as we descend below about 5,000 feet, we can't see anything. Well, it's sort of a bad thing because uh, there's no really, there's no place else to go if you're in El Paso. You got an Air Force base, it's about four miles away, but it's uh, got identical weather. So we get ready to shoot the approach and the captain has the first officer flying, which sort of got my attention right off the bat. So I kind of thought maybe the captain should be flying. And this is in the days, this is in the 70s. There's really no auto, uh, automation uh, to speak of. It's a 727, sort of a dinosaur. You never see uh, that aircraft anymore. Anyway, on our first approach, we get down the minimums, and we can't see anything. So we go on a missed approach. And... We ask for another, to be set up for another approach, and we come back around. And this time, I've got my seat right up between the captain and the first officer, and I'm almost standing up, looking over the nose of the airplane. We get down to minimums, and minimums are like 200 feet above the ground. And we don't see anything. We go missed approach. Well, if you've... Uh, you've probably already guessed that our fuel state at this point is quite low. In fact, it was uh, very, very low. We had enough uh, fuel for probably one more approach, maybe two. So we come back around, and this time on the, on the missed approach, I was looking over the no nose, and I noticed as we went missed approach, I could see straight down, I could see the runway. You couldn't see anything forward of the aircraft, but you could see straight down. So I told the captain, I said, well, hey, I saw the runway on the missed approach, but you had to look way over the nose. I said, why don't we just land long, fly, just hold it at 200 feet, drive over the field, and try to land long. So that's what we plan to do. Anyway, we come back around the third approach, and uh, in the Navy, we'd call it a trick-or-treat approach. You get my drift. And uh, we get over the runway, or we get at minimums, and the co-pilot holds the airplane right at 200 feet, which is quite low. And sure enough, as we get over the runway, we can see straight down, and he lands probably in the second half of the runway. You could not, well, you could. You, couldn't, you could have heard a pin drop probably for the next 
20 or 30 minutes because nobody said a word. Anyway, luckily this happened to me early in my career because it, it was a big uh, lesson to me. Uh, the captain made many, many mistakes. First of which is you, you never, ever have or leave yourself without a backup plan. And basically, he launched off on his backup plan without even verifying that the weather was good in El Paso. And if he had, he'd have found out that they were in the middle of a sandstorm. Uh, the second thing he didn't do, uh, the captain made a horrible mistake by not uh, declaring an emergency. We should have let everybody and their dog know that, uh, that we were in trouble. But he didn't, say, he didn't say a word to anybody. And then after it was all over, uh, you know, he really should have gotten the crew together and said, hey, this is what happened. This is what we should have done and uh, made it a learning experience. But uh, he didn't do that. So these are the type of things that I integrated into my uh, role as a captain in later years. Uh, I spent 30 years, almost 30 years with Continental Airlines. And to steal a phrase from a uh, Clint Eastwood movie, I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly of airline management and, uh, and really safety program as well. Started out with uh, Bob Six, who was a pioneer in aviation, basically, uh, for all practical purposes, the founder of Continental Airlines. Uh, from him to uh, a guy that was more or less really a corporate raider, Frank Lorenzo. I don't know if, if you all were old enough to remember Frank. Uh, he took over the, the company on a leverage buyout and uh, saddled us with quite a bit of debt. And uh, at any rate, his reign finally ended, and he turned the airline over to a holding group called Texas uh, uh, Texas, uh, Texas Pacific, group. Pacific Group, I'm sorry, yeah, Mr. Bonderman. And eventually to uh, a fellow by the name of Gordon Bethune, who really did turn the company around. Anyway, during those uh, years, I got to see the worst and the best of, uh, of management. Oh, and I forgot to mention this. We had two bankruptcies two Chapter 11 bankruptcies, and a merger of five airlines during that time. So you can imagine uh, what that was like. At any rate, when I first joined Continental, it was a professional, I thought, a very professional uh, organization. Uh, there was a lot of discipline in the cockpits. Uh, if we had one fault, it was the same fault that all the airlines had at this particular time. And that was that the captain uh, was sort of the ultimate uh, dictator. His, uh, he was almost unquestioned in his authority. So with that, he probably also thought he was uh, a lot smarter than everybody else in the crew. And this, of course, uh, didn't pay off in the long run because two, act, two uh, huge accidents occurred in the late 70s. And the causal factor, uh, one of the causal factors in both of these accidents was uh, a captain that was overbearing and uh, maybe a little bit, uh, well, I'll just say he was, the captain it was a little bit too overbearing. Anyway, both of these accidents, uh, caused a huge change in the way we looked at safety in the airlines. And I'll just briefly go over both these accidents. The first one was a, an accident in Portland, Oregon. United Aircraft flying from Denver to Portland, DC-8, which is a, a three-man cockpit, older aircraft, obviously, although this did happen in 1970. Uh, 1977, I believe. Anyway, to set the stage, uh, basically uh, the captain was uh, a very strong personality and not very well liked by most of the other pilots. 
the first officer and the uh, the guy in the back, the flight engineer, were a little on the weak side. So we had a, a bad formula right there for uh, for cockpit management. Basically, what happened is on approaching to Portland, they had an unsafe gear indication, and they started to orbit and troubleshoot the unsafe gear. In the meantime, the first officer and the flight engineer are managing the fuel. And they're telling the captain, hey, we're getting low on fuel. We need to make an approach here real soon. The captain is uh, taking it on himself to work on the gear problem. He's in the book. He's doing all the uh, procedures and so forth that need to be done. The other two guys are reminding, of the, reminding him of the fuel state. Unfortunately, they start on an approach without enough fuel, and they crash like several, several miles short of the runway. And uh, I guess really amazingly, about half the people on board uh, lived through that accident, which it was really surprising. The second accident, the probably the most well-known accident in aviation history, uh, was similar in some senses. Uh, it happened in the Canary Islands, two 747s. Uh, one of them was a KLM 747, and one of them was a Pan Am 747. A little background, they had all diverted into a field because there was a a terrorist event at the main runway. So now they're at this outline field and there's numerous aircraft on the on the uh, paddock area and they've been there for hours and every uh, everybody's getting impatient. Well finally they they taxi the KLM 747 out to the end of the runway and he turns around preparing for takeoff. And in the meantime, they're taxiing uh, the Pan Am 747 on the runway up to uh, another taxiway. Well, there's a uh, little bit of confusion. The controllers there are all Spanish, the Spanish islands. Uh, the, the Dutch guys in the KLM, uh, their English is pretty good. And, uh, oh, I forgot to mention this. I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but the universal language in aviation is English. All countries use English. However, as you uh, can guess, it's going to be an accent. So you're going to have somebody with a Japanese accent speaking English or uh, a Dutch person speaking English. But anyway, it's going to be heav heavily accented at times. So there's going to be a, a chance for some miscommunication. Anyway, while the, the uh, Pan Am aircraft is taxiing down the runway, the fog rolls in, and the visibility is like less, somewhere around 500 feet, just barely right at the minimums for takeoff. And the controller says something to the KLM flight. And in the verbiage, which is non-standard, he says something about takeoff. And what he really says is, prepare for takeoff. You're cleared into position, clear, uh, prepare for takeoff. Well, the captain misinterprets that uh, instruction for cleared for takeoff. The flight engineer uh, pops up and says, uh, Captain, I don't think we're cleared for takeoff. And the captain, who's very impatient, very strong-willed, he puts the throttles up and says, we're cleared for takeoff. A little bit of an argument ensues, but by this time the throttles are up and they're moving down the runway. And of course, we all probably have heard about this accident. It hits they hit the, uh, the Pan Am aircraft, and there's a loss of life of like 580 people or so. So it, was, it turned out to be the worst uh, accident 
in terms of life lost in, uh, in, his, in the history of aviation, really. Uh, as it turns out, during the uh, uh, accident investigation and everything, they find out that you know this captain was a very strong-willed captain. He was ex actually he was this, the senior guy at the airline, and he was also a spokesman for uh, KLM Airlines. So you know he had probably a fairly big ego. But uh, of course this this accident ended in disaster, and uh, part of the cause was the basically the cockpit management. Anyhow, out of all of this, these two accidents and other investigations that went on during the late 70s, uh, airline safety took a big turn. And they inst instituted uh, what they called CRM. CRM stands for Cockpit Resource Management. And what this did was it empowered the first officers and the flight engineers to be more assertive, to speak up if they saw something going wrong, and you know to get really in the captain's face if it took that. On the other hand, uh, CRM started training captains on what they really should be doing. If they should be using the, the first officer, the rest of the crew, to uh, maximize performance. Uh, during emergencies or regular operations. And I know this sounds, uh, it sounds intuitively obvious that, you know, this should have been done all along, but uh, believe it or not, this has really been a big turnaround in the way we handle, uh, especially emergencies, uh, in the cockpit. Uh, part of the training, the pilots go through training every year on the CRM, and one of the main things we do uh, is a simulator ride. And the simulator ride is done uh, primarily in real time, flying from A to B. Now, the simulator ride's only, well, it's two sessions of two hours each. And if the uh, simulator ride is going over the Atlantic, obviously uh, they can fast forward uh, the simulator. But the instructor in the simulator does nothing but act as uh, an air traffic controller. Uh, when you talk to him, you're talking to air traffic control. So the, the crew is on their, on their own, and they're given some sort of problem. The best thing about this training is the debrief, because the debrief is all on closed circuit television. And you get to sit there and watch yourself interact with the rest of the crew in problem solving. And no matter what you think you did, you didn't do. <laughs> and it's right there on videotape. And it's a very humbling experience, but a very educational experience. Uh, the only other thing I thought of was uh, I went to some friends. I happen to have two good friends that are in the safety business. One of them is a safety expert for Shell. The other one is a safety expert for ConocoPhillips. And uh, I asked them to boil down their entire safety program to what is the most important thing uh, about that safety program that's led to success. To, that has led to its success. And both of them said exactly the same thing. They said, good risk management has got to come from the top. The management has to set the tone. They have to set the example. Or, you know, it's not going to happen. And I agree. I saw the same thing in, uh, in, in aviation. Uh, when we had... Uh, Frank Lorenzo is a manager. Uh, we were merging several other airlines. Our standardization was terrible, and our and really our safety uh, record uh, took a downhill turn during that time. That's basically all I have. Um, 
You know, I got a lot of war stories, but I don't think anybody wants to hear all of those. Okay. Thank you, Mark. <laughs>